Welcome, everybody, to our latest installment in our deep dives into crypto and Web3, part of our Making Sense of Crypto and Web3 series here at Life Itself. And this week, uh, in my ongoing dialogue with Stephen, we're going to explore the thesis that Bitcoin and crypto more generally are a humanitarian force and can help undermine tyranny. Specifically, Bitcoin provides, or crypto more generally, provides a privacy-friendly way to store or transfer funds in situations where the state is an adversary, for example, when opposing a repressive regime. Again, for those of those new to the series, I just want to say what this is about. In general, Web3 has become a massive phenomenon with very bold claims made about its potential impact, claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism of better and faster to claims for the radical transformation and improvement of our economic and social systems. At the same time, there's an exceptional level of disagreement about these claims, even on basic points and definitions. Overall, this is one of the most controversial and polarizing topics we have seen with strong pro and anti camps. Within tech, it's, so I, we believe, one of the, the most controversial topics we've ever seen. A significantly disagreement cuts across classic ideological lines. This series is about make, helping you make sense of what is going on and to evaluate the key claims for and against crypto and Web3 that are being made. We're starting by exploring specific hopes and aspirations and their associated ideologies. One final point to remember as you listen is that throughout this series, we're still manning the various positions. What that means is that we seek to put forward the best version of any given position, even if it's not one we think is correct or that we personally agree with. So when listening, bear that in mind. We're not advocating one particular vision or another. We're trying to put forward the best version of them and allowing you to decide. So, Stephen, let's start out by setting up the best version of this kind of uh, crypto as a protection or as a, a tool for opposing uh, tyranny. Do you want to start us out on, on that kind of thesis? So this is a really classic argument that you often hear for Bitcoin and to a larger extent, kind of the, the broader cryptocurrency ecosystem is that um, it's a payment mechanism that kind of is suboptimal for most people, uh, but it's a payment mechanism of last resort for people who have absolutely no other choice to use it um, as a means of exchange because all other options are shut off to them because either they're in some sort of authoritarian country or they're a dissident or they're um, politically exposed person. Um, and that basically Bitcoin provides uh, basically a mechanism by which you can like uh, safeguard yourself against tyranny and more broadly kind of a way to kind of um, dissolve the kind of authoritarian and corrosive force of the regime that you happen to be living under that prevents you from transacting in the way kind of other people do. And I think this is a really important um, concept to kind of dive into because the argument against it and for it is very nuanced. Um, and it really stems from the fact that like both me and Rufus, we both live in, I guess I would call like, you know, stable liberal democracies. Like if you live in like, I don't know, the UK or Canada or the Netherlands or something like, mostly you live in a state of kind of relative peace and kind of, you know, financial freedom and, um, you know, general like social stability, right? Uh, but not everybody in the entire world lives in that kind of state. Um, and, I happen to live in Britain, you know, like I probably agree with probably like maybe 98% of the laws in this country because they all kind of mostly make sense and they uphold the rule of law and make sure that, you know, civil civilization kind of stays mostly stable and peaceful, right? Uh, but not everybody has the privilege to live under that kind of system, right? Um, and so the idea is that Bitcoin is a safe haven for one's investments or a shield against government tyranny because sometimes it's necessary to violate laws when laws are unjust or regimes are corrupt. And like nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience like are an integral part of how civilization as a whole progresses. I mean, they've been part of some very notable success stories that are just part of the kind of, as, as Martin Luther King said, like the, the moral arc of the universe kind of bending toward a more just society. And things like uh, the abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement, um, the rebellion against apartheid in South Africa, the LGBT movement, 
like Gandhi's uh, movement against the British colonialism and, uh, you know, the anti-Vietnam War protests are all, you know, classic examples of where people were, you know, they had to break the law because the laws were unjust um, and they needed to affect change by, you know, disobeying the regime that they happened to be in. And we look back on those events and say, like, this was actually for the best that they actually broke those things because the system that they were in was corrupt and they had to affect change from within. And so, you know, crypto, at least as its uh, proponents say, could actually be a tool for these people, these dissidents to actually affect change and be able to fund their kind of resistance and their uh, civil disobedience efforts to affect sort of a, you know, more egalitarian society from the system that they happen to live in. So I think that, yeah, so I think that's a really good point. So in, in short, it's clear, it, point one, if I'm hearing it, is that it is the case in history that there are um, unjust rules, um, oppressive regimes. There are ones that are visible in the world today. It's legitimate, maybe even obligation to resist them. And to come to the key point around here is that money, the ability to access or store money um, is, is going to be important. So if you're, if you're an opposition leader in some place, you, you're cut off from funds and you're kind of, it's very difficult, but you know, Bitcoin or crypto could be a way to get you money or to store your money uh, safely. Um, it, you know, there's an almost more subtle point that, which relates sometimes to the kind of like gold standard argument that also crypto is a safe haven against an oppressive regime. That, you, know, you can kind of hide your money under the mattress so it can't be taken, it can't be seized from your bank account. But I think that's almost a secondary point. Um, and there's, there's also to emphasize this resonates with a more general privacy arguments, which obviously, uh, again, connect with sometimes I'd say even the libertarian privacy kind of uh, set of kind of thinking about the need for tools to protect us from oppression by the regime, which includes knowing things about us. Um, so I, that's it. And are, are there, the question of course is, are there also concrete examples that people cite of this happening today? I, I, so let's come to that. Like there's one thing is to say there's this potential use and certainly I've, I've seen examples. So what kind of examples are we seeing, Stephen, where, you know, you could actually point to that saying, oh, people are using crypto or, or, or stuff to circumvent some kind of um, res restriction, you know, and it, and it seems in a, good, in a good endeavor. What kind of examples are we aware of there that we could point to? So I think we picked out two different examples that we think are kind of the canonical kind of legitimate use cases for this kind of thing. And those are the examples of Edward Snowden, um, the American whistleblower who um, released all the documents on the, the NSA surveillance program and then subsequently had to flee to Russia. Um, and the other example is um, this website called SciHub. So if we go on to the first one, Edward Snowden, um, he currently lives a life um, in Russia post all of his whistleblowing activities, which basically ultimately turned out to be kind of right about his, his um, uh, disclosure of what was an illegal program that the Supreme Court eventually decided was uh, you know, an unjust use of uh, the government surveillance apparatus on its own citizens. And uh, he was really instrumental in affecting that kind of change. But unfortunately, <laughs> he is sort of banished because, um, because of the political situation in the United States and is forced to kind of live uh, in Russia, which is one of America's obviously <laughs> biggest adversaries for currently at the moment as well. Um, but he currently lives a sort of fairly normal life uh, in Russia as much as one can these days uh, and kind of does a speaker circuit on like the information security uh, conference uh, circuit where he gives talks and talks to people about privacy and whistleblowing and freedom of the press. Um, and obviously he's a sanctioned entity um, it's illegal to send Edward Snowden money by normal transfers from the United States um, because it would politically expose the you know, center and everything. Um, and but Snowden is really able to do this and support his lifestyle um, and his activism by means of basically uh, taking his speaker fees in Bitcoin and then he converts them into Russian rubles to buy his food and everything. And um, you know that lets him kind of live a normal life. And um, I'd say the world is probably a better place because of the activism that Edward Snowden did to kind of expose these injustices in the world. And so this is a really canonical example of somebody that, who I may not necessarily agree with everything he says about these things, but um, he does use this um, at least theoretically towards some positive ends. And the second example is SciHub, which people who don't know already um, is a sort of illegal site that's run out of um, Taiwan or Russia or somewhere. It's kind of one of these like Pirate Bay style uh, websites that kind of exists in this kind of floating network of mirrors, weird images um, across the web. Um, 
which basically pirates basically every single scientific paper from all of the kind of um, major publishing houses like Elvisir and Wiley and MIT Press and all that, um, and then curates them into a massive corpus that anybody who happens to know like a very specific um, identifier for the paper um, can basically just go type it into Sci-Hub and then download the paper for free without being affiliated with the university, without going through a paywall, without paying one of the publishers for access to this knowledge. Um, and this is, um, for a lot of academics, this is like the holy grail. This gives them access to basically the entire corpus of all scientific human knowledge um, in one place, where otherwise they'd have to go through their university to you know, pay for all of these access and everything. And this basically just gives them it all for free. Now, this is technically illegal. It's a violation of intellectual property rights. Uh, because the rights and papers or the publication rights are owned by the publishing houses. Um, and this server is run by like one woman in Russia who basically takes crypto donations to basically, you know, fund the, the crypto or fund the hosting costs on the servers. Uh, and she's basically seen largely in the tech community and kind of the academic community as being kind of this folk hero. Basically, she's giving knowledge to the world for free and basically opening up whole new frontiers of scientific um, inquiry by lowering the barrier to information. And this is seen as a very good thing in many, many circles in Silicon Valley, right? Now it is a violation of copyright law, uh, although the jurisdictional boundaries of this are somewhat gray because like, you know, obviously US law doesn't actually apply in Russia um, for various reasons, but you know, from a sort of pure moral argument, you're basically, you know, she's stealing content from a site and then hosting it online in a way that's kind of set up in this censorship resistant way. and. Um, Although many people may feel this is kind of intellectual property kind, there's a lot of people that would argue that like the predatory business models of like the publishing houses are actually somewhat worse than what she's doing, which is very a nonviolent crime, obviously. She's, you know, pirating information. Um, and that some people believe that Sci-Hub is actually kind of a net benefit for humanity because like, okay, so maybe a few publishing houses lose some money, but like all of humanity gets access to this information. And so if you make a kind of utilitarian calculus argument, like this is actually kind of a net good for the world and it's funded by crypto. That's the fourth crux of the argument. So I think that's great. And I mean, I can I can add a, another you know example. I've been I've been sent several you know that women in Afghanistan who are maybe being threatened by Taliban were able to receive money from abroad. There are examples of even actually really Russian dissonance against kind of Putin who received money. I mean, uh, we'll come to actually one of them, the story of Binance and like Navalny. But essentially, there's quite a few examples that will be cited if you go out and look of this kind. Um, and you know, I think one of the points we're trying to also really emphasize here is that those those really have merit. Um, and going, I've been involved in open knowledge activism for a long time. I'm certainly very cognizant of uh, SciHub, even back in the days in the debate over um, peer to peer and music copyright uh, and so on. There's actually a lot of evidence that they were actually a net benefit, even actually to the labels. I mean, weirdly, there was, there was quite good evidence at some points that um, people, certainly in the mid 2000s, you know, using getting music over peer to peer actually increased sales overall and things like that to the actual uh, paid sales. But anyway, the point, the point is we're trying to put forward examples where there's what we're saying here, and certainly for even for our own part, is there are really credible examples where it's good that, you know, these seem legitimate or there's a really good argument people are like kind of like the civil rights we'll look back in 50 years just as we you know we look back on on, on maybe the civil rights we've now say wow you know people might be theoretically breaking the law in some technical way but they were really standing for a greater a greater justice uh, a greater good and it was and it you know and and what enables us to support that and if that's being able to make, send donations to you know Snowden via via by bitcoin or something that's that that's overall a good thing and it's enabling these people to do what they wouldn't otherwise be able to do you know people have to eat people need resources so is it like that's i think in a nutshell that's kind of it there are quite a few examples and we now want to come to like the kind of the evaluation and, and as i said i want to emphasize that this you could kind of see these examples crypto and uh, in terms of money it the bitcoin is actually just one um it's one part of a bigger argument, which is kind of similar about crypto in general, which is like cryptography, the ability to have private communications. And, you know, obviously privacy in general is, is uh, you know, that it's a good thing. So we want to bring up a couple of principles before we come into the analysis. And first of all, just a very, very simple principle. And one I think was put also very well on a recent podcast we did here with Corey Doctorow is these are tools, um, Bitcoin or, 
you know, crypto in this discussion is a tool. It's a tool that allows you to send or store money. And the question about any tool is, what are its actual potential benefits, actual and potential benefits and harms? Um, no, t most tools in general are, are never uh, just good or bad. They can be used for good or good uses or bad uses. They always have both. Um, the question is crucially, what is the overall kind of balance of those two things? So I think just to take the example that I think Corey provided was fantastic is, let's take asbestos. Pretty much we agree now, asbestos, while it's you know, fireproof, has all these benefits, we don't use asbestos. We bury it in the ground. It's not something we use. Even though it has got beneficial uses, the costs outweigh the benefits. We don't use asbestos. Then there's DDT. There's actually now a feeling that DDT is really bad. It's banned in most places of pesticide. But overall, there are benefits. There were significant benefits to DDT, which is why people use them. We've now decided that the costs outweigh the benefits, but it's still used in some cases. There are some, still some situations it's usable. And then finally, there's something like the internet. You know, the internet can be used for revenge porn. It can be used to bully people. It can be used to oppress people. It can be used to survey people. And overall, it seems like you know, we would think that the internet is a real positive good in the world. Though there are these negative uses, the good uses clearly outweigh them. Uh, would be, I think, a general sentiment. We could have that debate. But our point here is to make is that the basic principle, what category does Bitcoin in this case fall into. Of course, there are going to be some good and some bad examples of its usage in this regard. But what is the balance? So that's principle one of how we evaluate tools like this. The second, and I think it's what we can say as a principle, but it's certainly um, a thing we come back to and that we'd hold as a, a basic prior or thesis is that you generally can't solve people problems with technology solutions, especially problems related to state power. Technology can be of assistance, uh, but it could also be a real distraction from the real world. And again, I just wanna give one analogy before we get into our evaluation is what is called rubber hose crypto analysis. So one of the hopes around original cryptography, when we weren't talking about Bitcoin and crypto as tokens or money, you know, encryption was, oh, wow, this is going to allow, you know, using this, we can, we don't need the state or we can resist an oppressive state. You know, we can send private communications that can't be monitored and da, da, da. And, and encryption is really important. Tool. And there was an early objection or an early point made, which was called rubber hose cryptanalysis. And the joke was traditionally cryptanalysis means breaking a, an encryption key using technology or using you know some insight into a, a problem in the cipher or using brute force like trying numbers and the rubber hose re referred to the idea of beating someone the idea was that an oppressive regime wouldn't need to break your uh, your cryptography it could just arrest you and basically th threaten you with 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 being tortured or some other kind of thing to get you to give up your private key and once you've given up your private key they could read all your communications um and this is one of the great ironies that, in fact, encryption is most useful when you have a state that already obeys the rule of law and all these other things where they can't do that to you. <laughs> if in the US, if you don't give up your private key, there's not a lot the state can actually do uh, to you. Whereas obviously in other countries, which might be, or in other, other countries which may don't uh, respect uh, your, your rights in the same way, they could just threaten you in, in all kinds of ways. And this was a major objection to at least the usage of these kind of technologies in seriously oppressive regimes. Now, again, of course, there are some usages. And again, in, uh, there's an excellent piece that we'll put in the notes from Corey about this, that you can see this kind of technology is useful maybe on the path to a more freer regime. It might be useful at a point where you're kind of fermenting revolution, but it's quite limited. The key point was because of the rubber hose cryptanalysis critique, the use of cryptography in general, or in this case, the, the fact of kind of secret money or like pri more private money is quite limited, especially against a well-organized oppressive regime. Um, and its greatest usage is in a very temporary period when you're kind of building up your resistance and hoping to kind of roll back uh, the, the system when you know, you're kind of flying under the radar. So, this, this is something that we want to kind of just, those two principles we want to set up before we come to analysis. And 
do you, our, our, our critique, which we're going to go through in a moment in some detail, proceeds roughly as follows as you go through, as you bear with us. First of all, in the claim that basically crypto provides private ways to transfer or store money is that it just doesn't actually work um, in any significant way. Um, in, it doesn't actually help to assist the oppressed and undermine authority and regimes very much. Of course, there are anecdotes and examples, but in general, uh, it, it's not very good. It's not very private. Uh, it's quite easy for oppressive regimes to track money. It's quite easy for them to intervene. And in fact, it may actually do the opposite. At the very least, it may actually help, whether it's oppressive regimes or abusive organizations or other things to do their work. It, it may actually help them. Um, so there's significant costs that outweigh the benefits. And overall, overall, the critique would go, the harms outweigh the costs significantly in that of Alice. It's more like asbestos than it's like the internet. So do you want to start to take us through the critique, Stephen? What's the point, the first point that you want to take us through in that argument? Yeah, I, I agree with all that kind of like meta-analysis about like kind of assessing the value of tools based on the kind of the upside and the downside, and like tools that have more upside than downside, we should probably adopt, and ones that have more downside than upside, we should probably toss out or kind of ban, right? That's the kind of the essence of our analysis, right? And I think there's a kind of couple of fallacies kind of baked into the um, Bitcoin as hedge against authoritarian argument that I think are kind of really inescapable. I think number one is the, is the selection bias one. Um, and so we talked about the Edward Snowdens and the Alexandra Abutkayan of Sihab. Um, and, you know, obviously these people are probably like more like uh, egalitarian kind of people that want to affect positive change in the world. But like for everyone, like Alexandra or Edward, uh, there's probably like a thousand arms dealers or like cartel leaders or like warlords and strongmen across the world that would use crypto for um, far less benign purposes. Uh, and that may be a cynical view about the world, but like um, the hard truth is that that's the reality of the world that we live in in the 21st century. Like, even if you have like a very optimistic view about the human condition that we live, you know, there's an inescapable fact that we live in a world of scarcity with this kind of intrinsic kind of Malthusian struggle between individuals that pushes people into, into mind states of violence and crime purely out of desperation. So even if you view basically humans as generally being very good people at, at heart, like there are conditions that give rise to states in people's minds that lead them to do crime. And it's probably the most generous reading you can have of, of the human condition. In an enlightened world where we were all, I don't know, sort of enlightened bodhisattvas, we would all have like unbounded compassion for all sentient human beings. And like, there would be no desperation at all because we'd all live in you know, some sort of harmony. But, you know, alas, that's not the world we find ourselves in, right? There's still parts of the world where, you know, people live in a, in a Hobbesian pit, like life is nasty, brutish and short. And, um, I think the analysis of most people's um, worldviews is that you know, desire, longing, greed, and violence are just arise naturally out of the human condition. And we don't clearly know a way out of that condition fully yet. Or maybe, maybe some people claim to know a way path out. But like, you know, the reality is that this is part of the, the world we find ourselves in. And with that, you know, the partial state of nature that we find ourselves in, like there's, you know, cross-border illicit financing uh, is used as a means to um, enable some of these, these horrors in the world. And there are many undesirable things that happen. Um, there are things like human trafficking, you know, there are child soldiers and extranational arms sales and money laundering. And, you know, there are drug cartels that run rampant throughout the world. And all these things in aggregate produce mostly human suffering. Um, and the reality is that we have to be able to deal with that because it's a fixture of the life um, in a global economy. Um, and when we start building technologies that operate on a global scale, we have to take into account the consequences of how these technologies might enable these horrible things. And there's an unescapable kind of evil and bleak brute reality to the human condition uh, that we can't just ignore as technologists, right? We should build and design technologies which try to minimize and disintimize the things because that's how progress is achieved in the world. And as um, you know, ethical engineers, we should do this kind of meta-analysis of our tools and our technologies to ensure that, you know, like we said, the upside is greater than the downside. And unfortunately with crypto, it seems like uh, the opposite is true, that these things mostly enable the downsides. And we can kind of go into the details of that in more, more granularity. And just so, so to um, 
emphasize on that, I mean, there are, you know, just to take some of the, the examples we've, we've already seen, like, you know, um, let's just, just to, to make it concrete, you know, there is a lot of statistical data or, you know, really concrete data already of how much crypto has been used in um, basically ransomware attacks. Um, you know, it, it even seems to have been maybe a reason for a significant uptick in ransomware attacks uh, because it enables, you know, payment that would be otherwise more traceable. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, there's a fairly significant amount of anecdotes and other evidence that the original demand for Bitcoin largely came. Again, you might argue, well, but, but for kind of people buying, um, you know, buying things, illicit things on things like the Silk Road or other places like that. Um, you know, there's even like, fame stories. Now, again, you might be like, oh, you know, drugs, you know, many drugs should be legal or something like that. But the basic point is that if it's being used even by kind of ordinary people, it's certainly being used by other organizations. Now, I just want to emphasize, just to summarize this, this is point one. So what point was, even if, we, let's say we accept that Bitcoin it really works, like it's kind of, it's private, like the kind of, what it, I think a lot of people think, like it's kind of, it, it's difficult to be tracked and so on. The basic point is, if that were true, the weighting of people illegitimately using it to legitimately using it would be much more towards the kind of illegitimate usage. Um, again, we also make this point that the kind of rubber hose crypto analysis is not actually so much useful against oppressive regimes. And we just want to maybe make, make that point here. Um, I think we could come to that point first that, you know, trying to undermine powerful nation states is fraught with risks, even when you've got this private stuff, you know, there's, 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 there's plenty of examples um, where it turns out that, you know, the regime can still get something. And I think a good example of this recently of what we call the rubber hose crypto analysis, but in the case of Bitcoin or crypto, is the story around Binance, which is a crypto exchange, where it's kind of turned out that money, they were, people were trying to send money to a leading Russian opposition figure, but it turned out that kind of Binance had made it, you know, had an agreement with the Russian kind of tracking authorities to disclose all their transactions um, as, a, as, a, as a ground for operating in, in Russia. So, you know, because the state had just come along and said, hey, Binance, if you don't do this, we're going to shut you down or do this stuff. And the, the crypto exchange had kind of basically done that um, because that, you know, a lot of, they were doing a lot of business in Russia. So the, the basic point we have here is that it, it A, doesn't actually do a lot of protection in the case of the serious oppression or kind of tyrannical situations we think of. I mean, obviously, if you think of the US government as currently tyrannical, if you're on that point of the political spectrum or you think most kind of government uh, is tyrannical, then you would be more sympathetic. But in general, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be that useful, except in, in countries where, which aren't actually that tyrannical, it seems, at the present. Um, so that's kind of point one. That we have we could come back to that but the second point uh steven that we should kind of talk is is it actually correct that bitcoin is as hidden as people think yeah no i think that's kind of one of the big misnomers that people have about bitcoin um so bitcoin is pseudonymous which means that when you do a transaction on the bitcoin ledger you're associated with kind of a, a seemingly random sequence of alphanumerical um you know, characters, uh, which identifies you. However, since all of the transactions are associated with that uniquely generated um, sequence called your wallet address, right? Um, you can look at the flows of transactions between individuals uh, and you can kind of trace a lot of things. Like say for instance, that like you happen to be, you know, sending a Bitcoin transfer every single month to the same person. Like one might suppose for instance, that might be paying your rent. Or like, say you see like a bunch of money flowing into like, you know, um, a wallet that basically um, is associated with like somebody um, tied to like a dissident movement, right? You can trace all the money that flows back because you can isolate the addresses associated with the specific, you know, inflows of money into a specific address, right? And so by kind of looking at the metadata around these things, you can kind of infer a lot of structure about the market. And then whenever you touch one of these exchanges, in one of the American countries or the European countries. Obviously there's a centralized entity there, which oftentimes is required to do like KYC, drill your customer checks on the identities of the customers that it signs up, at which point then um, if there was kind of any kind of illicit financing, they would have to go subpoena the entity 
um, and then they can figure out the identities of the, the wallet addresses and all the kind of flows in and out of them. Now, those don't exist in the kind of like the Binances of the world and many of the kind of offshore exchanges where people just basically sign up whoever shows up to the website, right? Uh, but, you know, the reality is that um, basically for state level actors, it's actually quite tractable to actually kind of discern um, where the money associated with specific crimes um, is actually kind of originating from. And the ledger itself is completely in the public. Like anybody can trace the provenance of every single uh, Bitcoin all the way back to when Satoshi split up the first blockchain, right? The entire history of it is public, right? Um, and so like, obviously with all these ransomware attacks, you know, the FBI and the, you know, intelligence agencies in the United States don't have precise information about the culprits involved with these things, but they can look at where the funds are flowing. And if they happen to ever touch any kind of entity that happens to reside anywhere within the remit of the United States, which is vast, obviously they can go subpoena entities and figure out more information about these things. And so, you know, this is not terribly sophisticated technology that like only like the NSA has, like this is off the shelf kind of SaaS software that you can buy today to do, you know, a chain analysis of the Bitcoin blockchain. And this is readily available to both law enforcement and to basically anybody who wants to buy this kind of software. And that includes regimes like, you know, like Saudi Arabia or in like some of the sort of less human rights friendly <laughs> regimes across the world that can basically just go buy the same software. So it's readily available to, you know, authoritarian regimes that want to do the analysis of these flows. Um, and that pretty much distorts the entire, you know, notion that this can be, you know, basically moved around indiscriminately because, you know, it's really kind of quite hard to actually um, at least when you look at one blockchain alone to trace the flows of money um, and to hide from officials that are have a, the wherewithal to kind of trace the funds associated with some sort of um, money flow that they seem to be you know, yeah. not in their national interest. And just to cite him, I mean, there's, a, there's several papers by Ross Anderson at Cambridge that are cited in our reference. Uh, Ross is a leading figure in, in, in well, in, in, um, but yeah, computer science and, and uh, security, you know, in computer science and so on. And has written several papers also. And even people who try and do these things where you put Bitcoin in a, in a kind of system where you kind of shake them all around and give them back out and obscure things don't, don't work so well. And again, to emphasize, the irony again is, A, it may turn out it's not very private. But, and again, the an ordinary kind of, let's say, people who are trying to just protect themselves, who are, you know, like the dissidents, are probably the least capable of obscuring themselves compared to like an organized crime syndicate who might have the more sophisticated energy to really do what may be necessary to make it more difficult to trace, even if it's not impossible to trace. So this is kind of emphasize again, these points make it like even like more weighted towards those who would maybe abuse or misuse uh, this system versus use it correctly. And we should just kind of cite here, you know, Nassim Taleb, who kind of wrote this point up very articulately, you know, by its very nature, Bitcoin is open for all to see. The belief in one's ability to hide one's assets from the government with a public blockchain is easily transcribable at endpoints and not just read by the FBI, but also by people in the living room requires a certain lack of financial seasoning and statistical understanding, i.e. it's easy to do that relatively, perhaps even a minimal lack of common sense. You give us an example. For instance, a Wolfram research specialist was able to statistically detect and triangulize anonymous ransom payments made by Colonial Pipe 9 in May 8, 2021, and it did not take long for the FBI to restore the funds. We can safely assume that government structures and computational power will remain stronger than those of distributed operators who, while distrusting one another, can fall prey to simple hoax hoaxes. And he continues, I think this is a key line, the slogan, escape government tyranny, hence Bitcoin, is similar to advertisements in the 1960s extolling the health benefits of cigarettes. You know, smoke, smoke well to live longer. You know, use Bitcoin to escape government tyranny. And I think that's a very striking point because it is one, a point made uh, by the, the, the Bitcoin community sometimes or some parts of it. So overall, at least Nassim Taleb seems pretty skeptical there. And, and we're kind of setting out the reasons why that would seem to be a, a strong point. Um, so let's let's come to the next point. Um, you know, just and it's it's sort of worth you know saying. It, I think something just to bring out also to, to emphasize that at the end, which is it's also governments which are perhaps or at least you know we're not making a judgment, but who might be considered the most oppressive, 
um, you know, maybe countries like sometimes like Russia or China currently in the world, that people think that, who seem to often have the most sophisticated surveillance uh, systems and technologies. So the very ones that one might want to be resisting with this stuff are actually best placed to, to undermine it, uh, and particularly given the open trans, kind of transactional nature of, of crypto. And as we said, local crypto exchanges are forced to comply with domestic uh, know your customer laws. Uh, so again, the example of Binance and Russia, actually of Navalny. Now, what's the next point that we would make here, Stephen, that you want, we want to cover? Yeah, I think those are really important points that we should cover that we already kind of covered on in previous series, which I kind of call the last leg problem. Um, and this is the, the fundamental problem that if you want to take donations to kind of fund like a political cause or like sort of resistance movement or some sort of like, you know, coup of a repressive regime or something, right? Without the capacity to actually cash out the cryptocurrencies into the local currency, your hands are very much tied as far as like what you can actually do. Um, because if you can't actually turn your, you know, magic internet money into actual real money to actually buy things like, I don't know, food or, you know, petrol or guns or something, right? Then you're basically limited to people who will like take your, you know, bespoke internet coins and turn them into guns. And that's maybe there are people that will do that, but like, that's not the majority of like people in the, in the economy, right? So fundamentally, like the ability to cash out your Bitcoin uh, into, you know, the domestic currency of a repressive regime is always going to be controlled by the repressive regime because that's how they stay in power, right? They control the money supply with an iron fist generally. Um, and not just, you know, repressive regimes, but, you know, generally, you know, very liberal democracies will often have, you know, controls around capital movement if they tied or with, a, you know, illicit financing or associated with crime. And like, I think the best example recently um, is um, there was a, protest movement in Canada, I think it was associated with some sort of, you know, COVID-19 protests. And so I won't speak to the kind of <laughs> legitimacy of the movement, but it is a kind of canonical example of people who were soliciting international donations from people who are sympathetic to the movement up in Canada, and they wanted to donate to these people. Um, and the truckers really needed petrol to fund their truck or to fuel their trucks, right? And so they had all this Bitcoin. And then you know, all of a sudden, you know, they started like um, blocking the streets up in the major cities up in Canada. And, you know, that really kind of tends to, you know, uh, send off some alarm bells in the domestic municipality, right? You know, if suddenly public works are impossible and cities get shut down, then obviously the government's going to come in and start acting. And what the Canadian government chose to do was basically, um, you know, look at the addresses that all these donations were coming on because they had like a the crypto equivalent of like a GoFundMe basically you know, up there. And then you could look at the public address and the, the Canadian government could go look at the public address and be like, oh, no person associated with the Canadian banking system can touch this address, right? And then suddenly, you know, all their money was basically frozen and no Canadian bank would turn it into dollars and no crypto exchange would be able to route it through the banking system to give them actually Canadian dollars, right? Um, and Canadian Canada is not exactly a an authoritarian regime by any means, right? They're a fairly, you know, liberal democracy. But like, you know, this is just something like these states have the tools at their capacity to basically at a moment's notice, basically freeze accounts associated with um, entities that are, you know, at odds with the you know, stated goals of the state. And if a country, you know, as relatively kind of, you know, peaceful and benign as Canada can do this, you can just imagine what a kind of more um, less <laughs> less enlightened country could possibly do with people who were soliciting kind of major amounts of donations in crypto. Now, there's a kind of counter argument to this that Bitcoin people will make would be like, well, what if the entire world happened to basically run on Bitcoin? So this is the kind of hyper Bitcoinization mm -hmm. world in which basically, well, you don't need to cash out into Canadian dollars because you can just go to the petrol station and buy your fuel with Bitcoin. Um, so I think the best argument to this is probably presented in our previous episodes where we kind of talked about why that could never exist for both like social, ethical, and economic reasons. Uh, but really to say, we don't live in a hyper-Bitcoinization world, right? And I don't think we're ever going to live in that kind of world. So that as a counter argument seems to kind of not really hold much water. Yeah. So, I mean, just, just if I could just add on that, I mean, the logic is, imagine you went with that argument and we're imagining it's in Canada. Do we imagine the state wouldn't have some way to regulate or supervise those kind of transactions, even if they were now just purely in Bitcoin and you never cashed out. And if you do imagine the state did not have that power, 
wow, we're in a very, very different world. I mean, that implies a world in which the state can no longer basically collect taxes reliably, can no longer, you know, we're really into a kind of libertarian dream or nightmare, however you see it. And we've talked in some detail, as we say, in pre-suit assets, the post-state technocracy, various other episodes about why uh, it's both implausible that that would happen, but also might be really problematic if that happened. So we won't delve into that now, but again, in the show notes, we can link to that. Um, so to come to come maybe more a little bit more like the downside, we talked about basically why the upside isn't very credible. It doesn't seem likely, um, you know, even if you assume Bitcoin worked technologically, that it would actually, it wouldn't really help uh, dissidents or others that much. Um, you have to cash out. It's actually relatively easy to trace you, and, you know, and stuff. And it's and it's also widely used by the less uh, the less palatable elements of society for things we don't. Almost everyone doesn't support. Um, what what's the next point we have? You know, the, about shadow banking, Stephen. Yeah, I think there's a really key point that I kind of touch on the last part of that is that, like, you know, fundamentally, like, if you want to affect kind of reform or change from within your country, you know, crypto, in order for you to actually have any value as a kind of politically exposed person, you would have to move all the money out of your country to basically a regime that would be kind of adjacent or more friendly to your, your political cause. And now you can do that. But unfortunately, that means you also have to kind of like physically relocate yourself to that jurisdiction, right? Which for some people like that are fleeing kind of oppression, maybe that's a good thing. But like, um, if we're kind of looking at this from the perspective of, do we want to incentivize people to basically just like flee authoritarian regimes to other kind of countries? Um, that doesn't really line up with the kind of current way we kind of envision kind of, um, <laughs> you know, bringing about kind of more peaceful world. It's basically just have everybody kind of flee the authoritarian states to other countries because generally we have borders and we have- And that's, you know, and that's hard to do. I mean, just to be clear, yeah, it, is. Uh, it might even be a great idea, but general authoritarian regimes. But then, and I think that the key point we want to make here is, again, it's that point, you can't, have, you can't have your cake and eat it. If you allow people to kind of move money into adjacent jurisdictions, which by the way, authoritarian regimes will generally prevent and make difficult, but you also allow people to do that everywhere, which is otherwise known as shadow banks, shadow banking, tax havens, and so on. So I mean, like just coming in there, but that's, I think, a key, the key, a key point to make. Yeah. So like, there's a massive amount of like dark money that kind of floats around in what people call like the shadow banking system, which is basically, you know, non-bank financial institutions that basically offer things um, to reputable and sometimes unreputable um, institutions that kind of mimic the functions of banks, but with less regulatory scrutiny. Um, so like certainly here in like the city of London, we're kind of well known for kind of setting up lots of like opaque tax structures and trusts in like the, you know, the British Virgin Isles and like, you know, Panama and like, um, you know, the Caribbean islands are kind of well known for having these kind of very large pools of dark money that kind of find refuge um, in these jurisdictions with, let's just say, less controls. Um, and so it turns out, like, there's been a lot of great reporting by um, a lot of journalists across the world that kind of show that a lot of the world leaders are actually kind of deeply involved in setting up these offshore trusts. And there was a very, very famous um, leak called the Panama Papers in which, um, I guess, a very heroic person decided to simultaneously leak the legal documents um, for all of these uh, law firms that were basically facilitating all of these illicit flows across the entire world. And it turns out like there was a lot of very high profile people in our societies that were using these structures to basically you know, avoid taxes, to move money uh, outside of regulatory controls. Um, and this is a very real thing. And some people put it basically like a $60 trillion kind of global slush fund of dark money that's kind of floating out there. And generally speaking, this is not a, a good thing for the world. I think it's kind of a fair thing to say that, um, you know, having this money basically sloshing around tied to like oligarchs and dictators and not being put um, toward, you know, productive enterprises or reinvested back in economies or being paid taxes on uh, generally hurts literally everybody in the entire world. Um, and the Panama Papers really gave us kind of a clear indication of the kind of ubiquity of dark money flows uh, and their use by the kind of the world's worst leaders. Um, and just to kind of put like a real name on this thing, like North Korea is kind of currently using a lot of these kind of, um, you know, offshore structures to kind of launder money. And most notably, there was a very large cryptocurrency hack of this game called Axie Infinity, um, which turns out that like um, 
North Koreans were actually, you know, stealing crypto from these high profile projects and then turning them into, you know, a hard currency that they could then move to fund their regime. And so crypto, it seems to be, is extending the scope, reach, and decreasing the friction of the entire shadow banking system. Um, and that does not seem to be like a positive force in the world. Um, this seems to be basically like, we shouldn't be looking back on the Panama Papers and being like, that was the golden days of compliance. Like, but with crypto, that really could be the case. Like we could be entering an era where like, you know, the $60 trillion could, you know, quadruple in size because crypto is basically just allowing not just offshore trust anymore, but all this kind of, you know, flow of digital assets that are used for illicit financing of some very, you know, disreputable and unsavory regimes across the world. Yeah, I mean, to put it in a, in a nutshell there, there's, there's real evidence that North Korea is funding concentration camps in its nuclear program with crypto stolen from crypto hacks. Um, you know, there's a BBC, there's a BBC news article about this. Um, I mean, again, we want to be, you know, on both sides, we want to be cautious. It's still, it's so difficult often to get evidence, but there's a really, there's pretty, there's already pretty strong suggestive stuff saying, oh yeah, this is happening uh, at a significant level uh, there. So that it's kind of allowing, you know, illicit, that crypto is almost there rather than make it better for distance is on, on the contrary is more actually strengthening the ability of oligarchs, dictators, strongmen, uh, crime, criminal or syndicates to do illicit financing for war crimes, terrorism and evading sanctions, uh, which is not what we, not what we want. Um, you know, and the incorporation of crypto into the shadow banking system, uh, if it, uh, which is already happening, as we've just said, will provide even easier asset, ac um, access for disreputable individuals to avoid taxes and expand their holdings abroad. And instead of offshore shell companies, these individuals will just have stable coin and crypto assets to hide their money from tax authorities. And from the public interest, it, I think it does seem clear, I would even say, that none of this setup is desirable. It allows the already wealthy to avoid paying taxes and supporting public goods and the welfare state, which supports people with less resources. Um, so in that sense, crypto would end up exacerbating uh, wealth inequalities and allow individuals to circumvent the rule of law. Powerful, rich individuals undermine the entire social contract of democracy. Um, and we, we want to dismantle the offshore shadow banking structures that enable billionaires oligarchs to strangle democracy, not create more of them. Um, so that's, I think, a strong point there. And we come to our kind of final, I think, key point, or a couple of points. So there's also this kind of argument for Bitcoin as a hedge against authoritarianism, suffering from this, what we could call Keynesian fallacy of composition and selection bias. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that, uh, Stephen? Yeah, this is kind of a classic fallacy that Keynes used to talk about. Um, and just to kind of make a humorous quote, it's like, Composition fallacy is kind of given by this bad metaphor. Like if somebody stands out of the, up out of their seat at a football match, they can see better. Therefore, if everybody stands up, they can all see better. Um, and so, like this is the same kind of argument that like um, it might be a net good for small groups of individuals um, to use crypto, but in aggregate, the existence of the supranational payment system for illicit money flows is a vast negative externality to the world. And composition fallacy is always about kind of extrapolating from very, very small use cases up to the more general use case and supposing that, you know, the individual elements composed give rise to a greater truth, right? That's the essence of a fallacy. And that's what we see with crypto. Um, so certainly you can point to the kind of the Edward Snowdens and the sci hubs of the world, but like uh, there's a fundamental selection bias to the fact that those are the minority. Um, the vast majority of people that would use this kind of supranational um, dark money system are not the benign type because that's just the way that's just the world that we live in unfortunately um, and I think the comparison that we made in the last episode is that crypto is very much like asbestos like there is a massive negative externality toward this thing existing yes you can use it as an insulator it does sort of work for that purpose the only problem is that it slowly kills you right um, and you know, it basically turns out there's a better insulators that basically you can put in your house that don't kill you. So all things being equal, we should use the ones that don't. And that really applies to the entire overarching argument about the crypto so-called financial system is that like we have financial systems and structures that work. Um, 
why are we trying to replace them with things that have this massive negative externality associated with them for this kind of very, very small edge cases and corner cases of people like Edward Snowden, which, you know, you know, God bless Edward Snowden for doing what he does and everything. But like, you know, fundamentally, we have to look at the kind of larger picture of what this impact is on the rest of humanity. And we have to kind of do the utilitarian calculus to figure out, is this a net good or is it a net bad? Because there's always going to be a little bit of plus side and a little bit of neg side, negative. And we have to figure out what the balance of that is. And I can certainly empathize with the plight of refugees um, that this might actually be a tool for some people while still recognizing that the solutions to their plight might actually cause more harm to the global world by their very existence. And just like we said with the shadow banking system, right? if crypto happens to be enabling authoritarian leaders to basically enrich themselves and create even more concentration camps in their country, right? fundamentally, this is creating the environment in which there are more refugees. So it basically undermines its entire existence if it happens to be massively you know, negative in its externalities, which I think there's a strong argument to be made that crypto has massively unavoidable externalities that are inseparable from its use case because it is designed to sort of convent the rule of law. I think also um, a key point that we should make is that we that that we want to remember is that that we this is maybe the greatest potential externality that it is it's one thing to think carefully uh, and in kind of in a case of clear injustice such as the case of Martin Luther King and others or I mean you know Gandhi. Um, and say, okay, and to do so in a very clearly non-violent, disciplined way. And in the case here where we're kind of creating a technology, which A, may not actually even work that way, but even if it did, would essentially disintegrate. So, I mean, it goes back, I think, um, Simon Wardley, I want to say, I think I want to credit to him, but like really back at the beginning of crypto, it was like, this was like 2012, where no one thought, it's like, imagine Bitcoin succeeded. This would, could be a disaster in the sense it would undermine many, just the very existence of the state and all the things it does. We want to come back to that. People want to think very carefully through the logic. And this is why these episodes often come back to the ideology. If you are someone who thinks that even the current, um, you know, liberal democracies of Western Europe are kind of dystopian, you know, that the, the, the and there are many things, by the way, we have set out in this episode, we think there are many things that are sterotic, inefficient, ineffective. There's many things that are not working very, very, very profoundly in our world today. And not only with the state in our ability to address collective action problems such as climate change. Uh, so, you know, both of us and so myself are hugely dedicated to doing things about that. The question is, what is this the right approach? What, and uh, not only could it make things significantly worse, does it distract us? And so in this case, it really seems the balance of Kind of probability, the balance of evidence seems strongly in the case of that the, the harm versus the good, versus being a liberatory force of the world, nor a mean is you know generally not a liberatory force of the world, nor a means to counter authoritarianism in any substantial manner. At, at, you know, at best, it doesn't seem that best is even credible. At very best, it would be this was a small tool that is a you know during a brief period while we resist authoritarianism while we do it. And in that, in, often here, there's very little connection uh, with that. And it may, this kind of technology playing around, like, oh, we're donating versus crypto, d distracts us from the real work that needs to be done. But in fact, and, and, and that to do, in fact, it is likely uh, to largely amplify the worst parts of society's existing corrupt power structures. That seems the, the, the best reading of this. Um, and I think it's worth quoting Jackson Palmer here who was the creator of Dogecoin, which is now obviously taken off, but who is, he, 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 I mean, he was rather despairing of that. He gave a very powerful critique of the crypto ecosystem as an industry insider, someone who'd been involved in crypto in a, in a tweet storm. He said, after years of studying, I believe that cryptocurrency is an inherently right-wing, hyper-capitalistic technology built primarily to amplify the wealth of its proponents through a combination of tax avoidance, diminished regular oversight, and artificially enforced scarcity, Despite claims of decentralization, the crypto innocence, cryptocurrency industry is controlled by a powerful cartel of wealthy figures who, with time, have evolved to incorporate many of the same institutions tied to the existing centralized financial system they supposedly set out to replace. The crypto industry leverages a network of shady business connections, bought influence and pay for play media outlets to perpetuate a cult like get rich quick funnel designed to extract new money from the financially desperate and naive. And I think there's this aspect 
the, the key point there that we want to emphasize is to amplify the wealth of permits for a combination of tax avoidance, diminished regular oversight, and artificially enforced scarcity. So this question is, what, what, is the, uh, what is the externality even of the system? And overall, even on the merits of the case, what is it? So I think to be fair, for, to be to, to be fair, our, our, our evaluation of this the steel man thesis would be kind of a, a fail on this one. It would be that this it doesn't really hold up. And then on the balance of probabilities, it's more like asbestos than it is like the internet. Any closing remarks from you, Stephen, before we wrap? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, this is one of those ones that kind of like tugs at your heartstring a little bit because, like, you know, we all want the same thing. The crypto people and me probably. We both want North Korea to probably cease existing. Like we don't like it's the fact that it's an authoritarian regime, and anything that could undermine um, the North Korean regime to me would probably be like a good thing. But the caveat is I have to make a kind of utilitarian argument about these things. Like if the solution to the North Korean problem ends up creating more human suffering in its implementation uh, than it does solve, um, then that's not a solution I can probably rationally consider. And I think with a lot of technology, we have to kind of do this kind of utilitarian calculus where we figure out, you know, is this creating more suffering for more people in the world or is it enabling human flourishing? And I keep coming back to this argument because I think it's kind of the final argument on a lot of these kind of things that like, it seems like crypto seems to be kind of just the story of the world's power structures retold with the same people with the same incentives, if anything, kind of much worse incentives in many cases. And I just can't get behind the story that, you know, crypto is this kind of massively liberatory force in the world, even if I kind of empathize with some of the victims of these kind of authoritarian regimes. I just don't see this being a, a viable solution to the world's problems because technology can't solve people's problems at the end of the day. <laughs>